It's great to see everybody here today. Please turn to the person next to you and say, it's so nice to see you here today. We thank God for you. And I've got some slides coming up, guys. We've got those slides. I'd like to read. We've got the pictures. No, no pictures. Okay, I'll just follow on from what Keith was talking about, redemption. Oh, there we go. So there you have a picture of slaves in bondage being chained up. And I just want to read, uh, Sarah Adams was five years old when her mother was sold to a slave dealer in Lynchburg in USA in the mid-1840s. And the auction took place in a town called Marion. And Sally, uh, as she was called, was herself sold that day, but not with her mother. Uh, a man called Thomas Thurman purchased Sally to take care of his sick wife. She would never see her mother again. She was five years old, separated from her mother. For the remainder of her childhood, whenever she could, she would slip away. She would find solace under a tall white oak tree. All alone, she would wrap her arms around the tree's wide trunk and cry. The tree became the place where she would recall the names and faces of her family members that were sold away. A place where she could grieve, but also a place where she could find shade and respite from her sorrow. If we cycle through the next few slides, we just see the, the terrors and the horrors of slavery over 15 million. Next slide, guys. Uh, guys. Uh, we see uh, the different horrors of the uh, slavery and the different impact that it had on many people's lives. And uh, if you read about it, it's really quite uh, tragic. Uh, I won't go into too much detail, but if you look through the slides as they come up, <laughs> you'll, uh, you'll see that it's a really a terrible uh, thing that people had to go through. But which is worse, to be a slave or to be the slave trader? Hmm, trick question, hey? Which is worse, to be a slave or to be a slave trader? You know, Jesus Christ didn't come to just set slaves free, did he? What did he come? As Keith was saying during communion, he came to set us free, all free from bondage. So you can be a slave owner or you can be a slave, but you can all be enslaved to sin. So the real problem with mankind is slavery to sin. So God wants to set us free from that slavery. So we see the physical slavery, the physical chains, and these are pictorial of spiritual chains, which are far worse than physical chains because the spiritual chains have decimated human society and left us in a world that is in a mess because of these spiritual chains. So the Bible, uh, the 1 Corinthians 6 verse 20 says we were bought at a price. So God has bought you at a, an auction where we were slaves to sin and he has bought us out of that slavery and he has set us free. So 1 Corinthians 6 20 says you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Thank God for your freedom. Amen. So we have freedom. So Romans 6 verse 16 to 18 says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves as slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey? whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. So we're slaves, guys. We're either a slave to sin that leads to death or we're a slave to God. We're a slave to righteousness uh, leading, or a slave to obedience leading to righteousness. So God wants us to choose which slavery. But the slavery to sin leads to bondage and death. The slave to righteousness leads to freedom and love and joy and peace, and eternal life. Amen? Yes. So we choose our slavery. So but God, thank, but God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. Amen? So those pictures were just sort of a graphic representation of the importance of being set free from sin. So I wanted just to do that as an introduction today that we really were in bondage and that we have been bought with a price. So we've been set free. It's like we've been in a slave auction and Jesus has come in and said, I'll buy Brendan. And how much is that going to cost me? 
Uh, that'll cost you your life. You're going to have to die to set Brendan free. Wow. That's a pretty heavy price, isn't it? For the Son of God to come in and say, I'm going to die for Brendan. Wow. Really? You do that for me? <laughs> that's pretty crazy, right? But that's what he's done. So he set me free. So I need to appreciate that freedom. Amen. So let's, uh, let's open with a word of prayer this morning. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this time. We pray, God, that you would stir our hearts to appreciate the freedom that you have bought for us. Lord, as we celebrate communion this morning, Lord, that we would understand that redemption from bondage. Lord, those chains have been broken off us, that you've set us free, that you've bought us with a price, that we have had our chains broken, that we can enjoy freedom from the bondage of sin and be your slaves, God. Be your love slaves, Lord, that we can have freedom and liberty and strength and joy in the Holy Spirit through you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord Jesus, and, of course, the promise of eternal life. Amen. Hallelujah. The 2016 census data in Australia indicates that the uh, no religion section is increasing uh, rapidly in this country. Um, so those reporting no religion increased by about 3.3 million people over a 10-year period from 2006 to 2016. So that's over 3 million people now uh, reject the knowledge of God, which is a great tragedy as we've been indicating that faith in God is a logical consequence of observing the world around us and looking at the scientific evidence, the logical evidence is that there is a God, there, there is a creator. So it's unfortunate that people misunderstand things and they turn away from God. And Australia's in a decline. If you look at Christianity in Australia over the last 30 years, uh, you'll find that Christianity is not increasing, it's decreasing. And we've gone from 88% in the census in 1966 and we've gone down to 52% uh, in 2016. So over 50 years, it's gone down by 30%. So that's pretty bad. And that's just people who nominate themselves as nominally Christian, let alone church attendance. At the same time, there's still hope. There's about 60% of the country, at least in this census in 2016, who still believe in a God and still believe in a higher spiritual power. So there's still hope for that 60% that still acknowledge that there is some sort of uh, spiritual being, some sort of God. So what does that mean? It means that if the church is wise and if the church works together and does a good job, we can begin to reach these people. But how do we do that? We need to learn to work together. How do we learn to work together? The title of my sermon today is Wholehearted Commitment and Loyalty. Amen. So this is really good news. Amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, this is good news. It's good news. You know, I wish somebody had told me that I needed to be wholehearted when I was young. Uh, no one told me and I drifted through and I was half-hearted. Uh, uh, let's have a look at the scripture first. Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work at it with half your heart. You don't like my doctrine, do you? <laughs> What's the Bible say? Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. What does all mean in the Greek? All. Oh, uh, very good Greek students here today. So we work at it. Sorry. We work at it with all our heart. Amen. As working unto the Lord, not your human master. So if you don't like your boss, that's no excuse not to work hard. Amen. Since you know that you will, re you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Jesus Christ who are serving. So what does that mean? It means that when you, you are working, you are doing it with all your heart, you're serving God, you will receive a reward. That is good news. Whatever you do, God will reward you. Jesus says you give one cup of water to one of these little ones, you will not forsake your reward. Isn't that great? One cup of water. Jesus notices everything. 
I needed someone to tell me when I was young, Brendan, be wholehearted in everything you do. But I was drifting, I was wavering, and I didn't understand this great principle of being wholehearted. It is very important, no matter what you do, be wholehearted. Amen? Amen. So how, how to, to share my story, uh, when I play sport, you know, if you've ever played competitive sport, you need to be wholehearted. If you go out there and you're like, oh, it's a boring day, I don't like this game, you know, and, and, and for me it was tennis, so I'm playing tennis, you know, and if ever I'm half-hearted, guess what? You think I'm going to win? No, <laughs> I'm going to lose. As soon as I get bored and half-hearted, I'm going down. I'm going to lose. The only way I can beat somebody, at least of comparable ability, is i got to be really focused and i got to really try hard. I remember I was playing one year, I was playing competitive tennis, and there was this guy I really should have beaten, and I lost. I was so angry. I was so upset. And the team said to me, Brendan, you're not playing well enough. You're just not playing the game right. I'm like, oh, and I was so upset. But I submitted to the team. I wanted to be loyal to the team. And after we cleaned up everything, after the match we'd finished, they took me out on the court and said, Brendan, you've got to start hitting the ball this way. I'm like, oh. And so I had to go through all this training and coaching and I started improving. And so I applied myself and I began to get better. But I realized I had to be really wholehearted and not half-hearted. If I became half-hearted, I would not do well. So even just playing sport, you need to be wholehearted. Amen. Otherwise, it's going to be boring. If you do anything half-hearted, it's boring. If you go to the gym and you're sitting there going, uh, 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 uh. you know, and you got your two kilogram weight, it's boring. <laughs> you know, gotta pick up your 50 kilogram weight and go, yeah, and you'll have the whole gym looking at you. <laughs> 50 kilograms, that's crazy, right? So when you're wholehearted, you enjoy it, you feel like you're making progress, even in simple things. Wholeheartedness makes a big difference. It's really important. So God cares about our attitude, even when we're playing sport. Uh, with other people, no matter what it is. So when we study, should we study wholehearted? Even when you're at primary school, the kids are all gone. <laughs> so, you know, when I when I was uh, started university, uh, in my first year, I was half-hearted. I was distracted. I was disinterested. I didn't know what I was doing. And guess what? I failed first term. <sighs> oh no. And, uh, and my dad said, well, you'll never achieve anything. I'm like, thanks, Dad. Oh, what a, what a blow. And then the second term came around and I failed computer science. <gasps> oh, no, this is doing really great. So I'm doing really badly. And in third term, I got six out of 30 for a maths assignment. I'm like, mate, my life's going down the gutter. <laughs> I better start. I was playing too many. I won't tell you the game because you'll all say, oh, you're that old. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was playing computer games. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> I was playing computer games and I was not focused on my study. I was doing badly. I didn't have a vision. I didn't have direction. And I was lukewarm in my study. And I needed some kick in the backside. And so I did badly. And then I had to gradually pick myself up. But because I had no direction, I had no church to help me. I had no pastor to yell at me on Sunday morning. Amen? <laughs> so I was just drifting. I had no vision. I had no direction. So I needed, I needed God, but I didn't have God in my life at that time. And then later, a few years later, I'm doing a research project and it was boring. Uh, not because it was boring, but because I was boring. I was bored. I was half-hearted again. I had lacking vision again. You think I'd learn from before? No. Here I am making the same mistake. I'm being half-hearted again, and again I get in trouble and I fail my fifth year report. You'd think I'd learn, wouldn't you? Brendan, when are you going to learn? 
See, I didn't have anyone to tell me, Brendan, don't be slack. Don't be, don't be half-hearted. Be wholehearted. God will be with you. I didn't have anyone tell me that. And so again, I'm half-hearted. Again, I fail. Again, I'm in a pit. And again, I'm in trouble. And so my middle name is not Joseph. It's trouble. <laughs> Amen. It's BTK. <laughs> trouble is my middle name. I said to always get into trouble. And why do I get into trouble? Because it is half-hearted scourge. It was in my life. And then when I started my first job, guess what? It's half-hearted again. I don't want to do this job. Why am I doing this job? You know, it was a really good job. I was being, I was being hired as a research scientist looking at different dynamics of uh, the physics of yarn formation. I mean, it was a great job. But I was so half-hearted and so disinterested, I'm like, what is wrong with me? I just was lacking motivation again, lacking direction in life, lacking vision, and I was half-hearted. And what does half-heartedness lead to? What does it lead to? Failure and trouble. (laughs) So you think I'd learn? You know, writing this sermon has been really embarrassing for me. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my goodness, is my life that bad? <laughs> so again, I'm in trouble. I'm half-hearted. I'm in a pit again. I'm in trouble again. I'm like, oh, God, when am I going to learn? When am I going to get this half-heartedness out of me? Amen. So I'm in trouble again. And I'm like, oh, no, this is the worst trouble I've ever been in my life. This is really bad So because I was half-hearted in my work, I got into a big trouble. Now, God is gracious. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. God didn't say, well, that's it, Brendan. Too many half-hearted mistakes. You're done. He didn't say that. He said, Brendan, I'll help you. Thank you, God. Help me, Jesus. So God helped me and uh, uh, my whole life was resurrected from the dead. And here I am today. Amen. So that was really great. Uh, fortunately, when I got married, I didn't make the same mistake. I was not half-hearted in my marriage. Amen. Phew. <laughs> Thank God. So can you imagine being half-hearted in your marriage? Like, yeah, what do you want? What's, what's for dinner? What? You haven't cooked anything yet? Oh, not takeaways again. Oh, my God. <laughs> Can't you change the channel? I'm too lazy to change the channel. Please change the channel. Oh, man, has anyone vacuumed this carpet in the last five years? Oh, my goodness. (laughs) A half-hearted marriage is a disaster. Why? It doesn't matter who you're married to. If you're half-hearted, it's going to be a disaster. Doesn't matter who you're married to, you can be married to the most perfect person. If you're half hearted, you're going to destroy the marriage. Amen. I was sharing with the men on Friday night. I said, I've had a number of spiritual interactions with the enemy's kingdom, uh, but I've only met one angel. And then I married her. Ha oh. <laughs> ha. So. so it's true. It's true. I went home and I said, God, I met an angel. It's true. Um, that's not a lie. I do lie, but that's not a lie. <laughs> so so you've got to be wholehearted. You may marry an imperfect person. Of course, we all marry an imperfect person, but we must be wholehearted. We must be diligent in our study, in our work, in our sport. In our marriage, everything comes down to whatever you do, be wholehearted. Amen. So Colossians 3.23, we must get this through our brain. I need to be wholehearted. Amen. And I'm probably the worst offender as I've given you my record of transgressions. You might think, man, I'm a loser. Yes, I was a loser and I was losing a tenor, so I was losing at my work, I was losing in my study, but somehow God is gracious, amen? And God helps us and God picks us up, but we must learn the lesson of being wholehearted, amen, and be, being loyal, being committed. 
A photographer tells a, of a story of a young man who wanted duplicate copies of his girlfriend's picture. The photographer noticed the following inscription on the back of the picture. My dearest Tom, I love you with all my heart. I love you more and more every day. I will love you forever and ever. I am yours for all eternity. Signed, Diane. P.S. If, if we ever break up, I want this picture back. <laughs> Something's not right there. <laughs> you know, I gotta love, <laughs> I gotta love you forever and ever. <laughs> but give me the photo back, please. <laughs> it's just we need, you know, this society. We need to learn to be committed. We need to learn loyalty. We need to learn to be wholehearted. Amen. So the only way to enjoy life, this is a doctrine according to Brendan. The only way to enjoy life is to be wholehearted. Amen. That's not in the Bible, but it's in my Bible, if you like, that I've learned the hard way. If I'm half-hearted, I will not enjoy anything. I can go out on recreation. And I'll be bored and I won't enjoy it even though I, because I'm half-hearted. So we need to do everything wholehearted. Life is short. Amen. Go talk to an old person. That will tell you, yes, life is short. The last 30 years have gone past so fast. It's amazing. Go and talk to an older person. I remember I was work, leaving work once and this old, older guy, he was in his mid-60s, and he said, oh, I've been here for 32 years. It seems like yesterday. And I'm like, I just couldn't forget that statement, that 30 years had gone by and it seemed like yesterday. So when you're 30, please remember life's short. So you've got to use your time wisely. Don't, be, don't spend 10 years being half-hearted. Don't follow my example. <laughs> be wholehearted. Amen. Be on track. Be zealous. Be fervent. And be, be on direction with what God has for your life. Amen. So if I'm half-hearted in my study, whatever I study will become boring. You can study the most amazing things, but if you're half-hearted, it will be boring. If I'm half-hearted in my work, like me, I had a great job, but I was half-hearted, it becomes tedious and boring. If I'm half-hearted in my sport, I'll just lose. It becomes a waste of time. If I'm half-hearted in my friendships, can you imagine being half-hearted in your friendships? You know, it'd be like, Lukewarm coffee, you know, it's just boring. It's just uninteresting. It's like, you know, imagine sitting there with a half-hearted friend, you know, they'll be sleeping while you try to talk to them. <laughs> I've done that to my wife, actually. <laughs> Fall asleep while we're having lunch. Um, so we need to be wholehearted, and especially in our marriage, your most important relationship on earth is your relationship with your spouse and so you need to be wholehearted. So how do you prepare for a good marriage if you're single? How do you prepare? You practice being wholehearted. You practice being loyal. You practice being faithful so that when you are married, you have a great marriage and you treasure that person because you are loyal. You're faithful. You're committed. You don't take it lightly. You don't be half-hearted. Otherwise, you can lose it. So we build a strong marriage on our wholehearted, faithful commitment. Amen? So this is really important. You know, in today's society, marriage is difficult. Marriage is not easy. Marriage is under attack. Society's values degrade marriage. We treat marriage like a piece of paper. In fact, many people say it's just a piece of paper and they throw it away. But we should not be like that at all. God does not throw it away. God says marriage is sacred. Amen. We need to say, what is sacred in my life? Is there anything sacred in my life? What does sacred mean? Sacred means it is holy, that it cannot be defiled without severe consequences. So we've got to be very careful. So we, we can only really enjoy life when we're all in. If we're half-hearted in our job, we'll always look for another job. We'll always be miserable. 
If we're half-hearted in our friendships, we'll be distracted. If we're half-hearted towards God, you'll be miserable. Why? Because you're sort of like, well, Jesus is sort of a nice guy, but the devil's sort of promising me over here, and so which way do I go, you know? The devil's sort of promising me this, and Jesus is really great, but he's a bit tough on me, you know? He wants me to give up all my bad habits. and <laughs> So I'm sort of stuck, and I'm sort of, well, well, you know, maybe I'll go to church, maybe I won't, what will I really do? And we're half-hearted, and church is like, oh, didn't you enjoy church today? Oh, I don't know. Can't really make up my mind. You know, am I really going to follow Jesus or am I going to really follow the devil? Oh, I don't really want to follow the devil, you know, because he's going to hell. So, But I don't really want to follow Jesus because he wants me to give up my bad habits, which I sort of like. You know, so we're stuck. And that's a miserable life, guys. So we're going to be whole-hearted, amen? So we're going to be saying, Lord Jesus, I'm going to follow you. Your kingdom is awesome. You have the best kingdom of love and joy and peace. And I trust you, even though I go through some fire, I trust you that it will be great for me. Amen? So we want to be wholehearted for God. We want to be wholehearted in life. So be committed. Uh, And uh, Joel Osteen said, be committed to your spouse even when they don't deserve it. What an interesting statement. You know what? They never deserve it. (laughs) That's a true statement. I never deserve it. No one deserves it. No one deserves grace. No one deserves forgiveness. No one deserves mercy. But we're committed because we're loyal people. Amen? Not because they deserve it. Not because they reach a certain standard of behavior. But because I'm committed. I'm wholehearted. And that's it. I'm done. Amen? So we're fully in and it's not dependent on whether the other person deserves it or not. We're loyal. We're committed. We love people. We forgive. Amen? So very important. So be loyal when life is not fair. You know, life is not fair. Life's really tough. But that doesn't mean I have to be unfaithful. That doesn't mean I have to be disloyal. I doesn't mean I can be treacherous or disingenuous. Amen. I can be a loyal person, even though other people around me may not be. I can be faithful. I can be committed. So we can be a person that does not let other people down. Amen. You want to be a loyal, faithful person that doesn't let other people down? Amen. That's really important aspiration. I've always tried to aspire to be a person that does not let other people down. Very important to be a person that doesn't disappoint others. Amen. So loyalty prevents us from being disingenuous. Disingenuous is your English lesson for today. Amen. It means that you're not being fully honest, not fully telling the truth. It means a bit deceitful. Amen. It's a nice sounding word for you. Go and impress your boss. But don't tell him he's disingenuous. <laughs> He'll get in trouble. <laughs> okay. So God is looking for loyal people. Amen. God is looking for wholehearted, loyal people. He is not looking for talented, smart, good looking people. Amen. God is looking for wholehearted people that are loyal. God doesn't care whether you're rich or whether you're poor. As I said to this guy in the mall yesterday, the lights just went on his eye, in his eyes. I said, God doesn't care whether you're rich or whether you're poor. And he looked at me like, wow, really? And it just was a revelation to him because he obviously was a very poor person. So the prophet Hanani confronted King Asa and because of his compromise and told him that God is looking for loyal men and women. 2 Chronicles 16 verse 7 At that time, Hanani the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because you have relied on the king of Syria, and you have not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Assyria has escaped from your hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth 
to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Amen. In this you've done foolishly, therefore from now on you will have wars. So always a good one to remember, 2 Chronicles 16 verse 9, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth looking uh, to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Amen. So what is God looking for? Loyal, faithful, wholehearted people. Amen. Can you be wholehearted? Can you be loyal? Can you be committed? Yes. Amen. Well, God will choose you. God is looking for you. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 6, many people will proclaim their own goodness, but who can find a faithful man? So we want to be that faithful man. We want to be that loyal person. Amen. So one definition of a friend is that a friend is one who walks in when others walk out. Amen. So what do we mean by commitment? I just got to wrap up very quickly. But we were going through church stats recently and I looked at the church average in 2006 for April. We had a glorious attendance of 123 people. And uh, after 11 years of hard labour and hard work, we got to 2016 in April. You know what the average was for April? We went from 123, we grew fantastically to 130. <laughs> 11 years, hard labour, hard work, ups and downs, betrayals, broken trust, stress, disappointments, hard labour, and at the end of the 11 years, we grew to 130. Praise God. You know you know what that means? Like my dear wife has been faithful, man. She's been loyal. She's put up with me. <laughs> She's, you know, as soon as she married me, she had it started having trouble. <laughs> Why? Because my middle name's trouble. <laughs> so as soon as she married me, she's having trouble. <laughs> so she's had so much trouble. So for 11 years, my wife has just laboured, hard labour, hard work, persevered, and at the end of 2016, how much progress have we made after 11 years hard work? Man, my wife should look at me and say, this is it, that's it, I'm done, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> I'm out. She'd have every reason. 11 years hard work, I'm done. This is too hard, I'm walking out. We're not going anywhere. Don't you think that would be reasonable? A normal woman would do that? There's a lot of stress and pressure and disappointment and tears along the way. But Helen's faithful. Amen. So I really thank God for my wife. Not many women would put up with me. Not many women would put up with all the stress that I put them through. And she's done really well. Amen. So I really want to commend Helen to you because I think she's the best. <laughs> I'm not biased at all. <laughs> <laughs> so Proverbs 37 verse 5 says, Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. So God wants us to be committed. Commit yourself to God. Be wholehearted. Be committed. Amen. And Proverbs 16 verse 3, Commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. Your plans will be established. So commitment is the quality of being dedicated to a cause, an activity, an engagement or obligation. Amen? So we can't just go by our feelings, guys. We can't live according to our feelings. We need to be committed. We need to be loyal. We need to be faithful. And that overrides my feelings. It overrides my disappointments. It overrides my conflict and my anger and my stress because I choose to be loyal even if I'm having problems and arguments and stress. I choose to be faithful. I choose to be committed because this is where God is taking us. Amen. Do we hear an amen? amen. Hallelujah. Oh, do we have any committed people out there? Amen. We've got to be committed to God first of all and then committed to the work that he has for us and we've got to be loyal to the people that he brings into our life. Very important. Amen. Mel Schwartz gives this great quote. I think it's in the notes. The difficulty is that we're making promises about behaviours and outcomes focusing on the results but ignoring the process necessary to achieve the goal. 
The outcome is simply the byproduct of the flow, flow of process. If we learn to commit fully to the process, then the outcomes will be what they should be. So what that means is be committed to the process, not the results. You can't commit your, to getting a, an A for your study. You can commit to studying hard. You understand the difference? You're not committed to the result. You're committed to the process. So we serve God not because he's going to bless us. We serve God because we love God. We serve God because he's worthy. We serve God because he's awesome. I don't give up on God because I don't get the result I want. Because the church doesn't grow for 11 years and it's hard labor, but we serve God with joy and we continue to serve God with joy because we focus on the process and we let the results be God's decision. Amen? So we focus on loving people, serving God, being faithful, working hard. We do what we need to do. We focus and we're committed to the process and we will reap a harvest. We will see good results because God promises that. But we don't focus on that. Amen? So it's very liberating. But we need to be committed. We need to be loyal. We need to be wholehearted. Amen? I needed to hear this sermon 40 years ago, <laughs> but I didn't. And I made a lot of mistakes in my life. But you have the blessing of this sermon today. So you can go home and say, no more half-heartedness. I choose to be wholehearted. Amen. Amen. Turn to person next to you and say, I will be wholehearted. I will be loyal. I will be faithful. Amen. Okay, let's have a song before we close. Thank you, Jesus. Father God, we thank you, Lord, that you're fully committed to us, that you didn't give up on us, Lord, when we let you down. Lord, you keep forgiving us. You keep picking us up. You keep rescuing us out of our pit that we dig for ourselves, Lord. Lord, you are faithful to us. You're so patient and you're so kind. Lord, you tolerate and you endure so many things. But God, you continue to love us. And you are loyal to us. You're faithful to us. You're committed to us. And God, we want to reciprocate. We want to be that loyal person. As the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 16 verse 9, the eyes of the Lord roam to and fro throughout the earth, looking for a people whose heart is loyal to you. And you will show yourself strong on their behalf. Lord, we want to be that type of people. We want to be loyal. We want to be committed. We want to be faithful, God. We don't want to be treacherous or betray one another. We don't want to be half-hearted. We don't want to be slack. Lord, we want to do great things for your kingdom's sake. And as a church, as we commit together, as a body of Christ, we can achieve great things together as we work together, as we forgive one another. Lord, you can work in our midst. You can do something beautiful. And Lord, we just pray for the marriages today, those that are struggling, perhaps those that are half-hearted. Lord, we pray that you would touch them today. We pray, God, there be an infusion of wholehearted devotion. We pray for all the marriages in our church, there be an infusion of love and joy and peace. Lord, that the half-heartedness and the boredom would leave and there'd be that joy coming back into the family. Lord, we pray. Lord, touch your people today, God. For those of us who are single, we just pray that we be wholehearted in our study, that we be loyal in our friendships, we practice being faithful people. We develop a character that's faithful and committed to God's purposes. Lord, we want to practice being faithful, committed, loyal, trustworthy people.
thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Why don't we stand and sing this song? Desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. you're here today and when we showed the pictures of the slaves perhaps you yourself felt that the chains of sin were still in your life we'd like to pray for you today we'd like to pray that you can be set free we'd like to pray for you that you can have eternal life through Jesus Christ and that you can receive the gift through what Jesus has done for us. We'd like to give you that opportunity today. Please feel free to come forward. We'll pray for you. If you'd like prayer uh, regarding uh, the message today, regarding being committed, regarding being half-hearted, perhaps you've struggled to be wholehearted in various areas of your life, we'd like to pray for you. You know, I needed people to pray for me. And we all need each other to pray for each other. Amen. So please feel free to come forward. We'll have a time of prayer. And we'd like you to commit your life to Jesus Christ and be faithful to him. Amen. Hallelujah. Father God, we just thank you so much. Lord, you're so great. You're so awesome. Lord, it's a, such a tragedy that people turn away from you. Lord, it's such a tragedy that people don't get to know your great love for them. They don't know how incredible you really are. And Lord, the devil deceives people and they become rebellious and turn away from you. And Lord, it's such a great tragedy. And Lord, as a church, God, we want to do our best to reach out and show the love of God, the gift of God to people who don't know you. Lord, help us to have a bigger heart of kindness, a bigger heart of love, to reach out to those who are going in the wrong direction. Oh, Lord, we pray. Help us, Lord God. Change our heart, Lord God. Help us not to be consumed with our own lives, but help us, God, to take on your interests, take on your values, care for those you care for. Just talk to God in your heart today if there's anything you need to say to Him. Say, Lord,
Thank you, Jesus. Father God, we just pray a real blessing upon all our people today. Lord, that you would touch their hearts, refresh them, refresh their vision, strengthen them, Lord, for all the struggles and trials of life that we face. We pray you be with us through all our pains, our disappointments, our ups and our downs. Father, we pray for your comfort. We pray for your strength. We pray for your vision and direction in our lives. Help us, Lord God. Lord, we need you every day, God. Lord, strengthen us today in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh,